Right, uh, welcome everyone to this afternoon's session, uh, which we've called Treading New Territory. And what I hope this distinguished panel of speakers are going to uh, give us is uh, an insight into the campaigns that they have led and run and why they did, and also that we'll all get some takeaways of how you can change the world from looking at the examples of women who already have a bit. So that's uh, what I hope we're going to achieve during this afternoon. And I'm going to uh, introduce the speakers one by one. I, I have to start off by apologizing for the lack of coffee. We're making it up for, up for it later with alcohol. <laughs> um, you know, if you had a choice. Anyway, um, our first speaker is Maria Beatrice Giovannardi, who's been an activist fighting for women's rights in many different countries. Her first project uh, was about using uh, social uh, enterprise with the mission of crowdfunding geographical safety information for women, which seems really impressive. But she's currently campaigning to change the definition of woman in the Oxford Dictionary which, if you read it, has a whole load of very sexist, loose woman examples and so on. Anyway, let me let Maria explain. <laughs> yeah, so basically the campaign started uh, last January and I was Googling the women's surnames because I was looking for surnames of women to rebrand a project of women's rights. and. Well, as, I, I was, as I googled, the results that came up were uh, bitch, frail, biddy, wench, petticoat, peace, bit, mare, baggage, bint, uh, and so on. And I was like, what's going on? Um, and then basically, I, did, I tried to understand where they're coming from. And uh, so I also started looking to the definition of woman and some of the examples where um, I told you to, be, to get home when I get, I told you to get home when I get, when I tell you a little woman, or one of his sophisticated uh, women, or, um, okay, I'm going, uh, if this doesn't work, they will become women, women of the streets. And so basically women were, de were described as property of men, sex, sex objects, and just like in, in general, like a lot of the examples were discriminatory. So I started looking at other search engines as well as other dictionaries and, um, actually found out that Oxford was li li licensing, li licensing its content to, to Google, Bing, and Yahoo, the search engines, and, um, and so it was their definition. And the other dictionaries are a bit better, they're not the best, but they're a bit better, and um, basically I, conf I, I shared this finding with uh, a group that I'm part of, which actually Fawcett is London, the Fawcett is London group, and we were all outraged by this definition, and we decided to to write to the dictionary makers and find out why this was going on, and none of them responded. So we decided to actually start a campaign to, to remove the sexist, like to basically improve the, the definition and make it non-sexist. And uh, so we, we started to change our org petition, which at the moment has about more than 30,000 signatures, and uh, it was started in, in June, basically, in, yeah, end of June. In a matter of a week, the Guardian actually um, shared the campaign in a double uh, page spread on print, which was amazing, we were all shocked. And uh, also changed our org, pick up, picked up the campaign and decided to support us and help us uh, promote it. And uh, basically after, in a matter of like a month, uh, the campaign reached 25,000 signatures in August. And that's when Oxford uh, University Press decided to address the, the issue. And they wrote a blog post saying that the, um, the, the, the role of the dictionary is to be descriptive of language, not prescriptive. Uh, but we, and that if something was offensive, it, that wouldn't mean necessarily, that basically they said they would, they would investigate, but they wouldn't necessarily change something because it was offensive. And we said, the bookseller contacted us for a comment uh, and we said, well, I, I said that like it's not enough, like that they were making a commitment to the actual change, and they were being a bit patronizing as well. 
And uh, that's when a lot of media actually picked up the campaign uh, because I guess a lot of other women were trade as well. Hopefully. And so in a matter of like a week, the campaign exploded. We were published on like anything from New York Times to CNN to we were one of the Guardian's News of the Week, which was amazing. And up, as of today, we still have not, like Oxford hasn't changed the definition nor has given another feedback, like another comment, but um, we're still pushing them for the change and uh, because we believe that having a definition like this in, in the dictionary, well, first of all, there's like a larger conversation about like what, who a woman is, or, like who says what a woman is. And right now, of course, like men have been describing women for, for throughout history and they've written most of the books, but uh, I don't feel represented by this definition. A lot of other women don't. So we, we just want the dictionary to stop perpetuating negative stereotypes that also put women in a disadvantaged position. Because if you look at the definition of man, it actually says a solid labor man or a Cambridge man or one of the best men. So it's like, <laughs> like enough is enough. And it's actually very dangerous because it could influence the conversation and like algorithms online yeah. because it's all over the internet and you know, like these things are being put into artificial intelligence and this is gonna be very dangerous for the future. Yeah, so I hope you can join us if you haven't signed yeah. already. <laughs> Well, we move from a campaign which has been short but quite effective to a campaign which has lasted for a long time. I first learnt of the work of Elizabeth Ann Onyu when I was a primary teacher and one of the children in my class had sickle cell and was in huge pain from it. And I admired the work that she had done setting up a nurse-led centre on sickle cell and thalassemia and the campaign that she ran on it. And then she led the campaign for a statue, which has succeeded, of Mary Seacole. Um, and it's worth going to see it, uh, if you want, at uh, St. Thomas's Hospital. So, Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Fiona. Hello, everybody. Come on. <laughs> I forgot to say that she'd been made a dame for all that. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'd, I'd actually love to take this opportunity to thank Fiona because Fiona supported me and the Sickle Cell Society when it, it wasn't fashionable to do that. And she does it in a very quiet, very important way. So, Fiona, thank you. Mm. <laughs> um, and I'd like to thank the Fawcett Society for inviting me to take part in the, in the panel discussion now. And when I was trying to think in a few minutes what aspect of various campaigns um, I and, of course, others have been involved in, I thought it would be perhaps useful to focus on an issue that primarily affected women. And I'm going to draw, just take a, 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 a small section from my uh, memoirs that I self-published a few years ago, uh, and they're called Mixed Blessings from a Cambridge Union. And um, if you look on the front cover, that's my late mother, and I'm nine months sitting on her knee. I'm sorry. Uh, so it, the, the books are outside as well, and I'm happy if anybody wants to have a chat with me, and even buy one later, but um, <laughs> hey ho. But, we, um, we permit advertising. Thank you, thank you, Fiona. <laughs> um, so, uh, in your introduction to how people might talk about their campaigns, Fiona, you mentioned perhaps what brought them into campaigning. And uh, writing your memoirs is a very cathartic, sometimes painful, but for me, m majorly um, positive. And it allowed me to sort of reflect on, well, why did I get involved in campaigns? And it was actually um, realizing that I, I carry, I still do, anger in my belly, and that, that I, fortunately for me that I use that anger positively rather than allowing it to eat into me because I, I was in care for nine years. It wasn't because my mother, um, re she never rejected me. She, she was a student uh, just after the Second World War in Cambridge um, doing classics at Newnham College, met my father. They never married, she couldn't even bring herself to tell her parents that she was pregnant, never mind that it was a black gentleman that uh, 
impregnated her. Come on, let's use Victorian language here. Um, anyway, so l l let's move on from that. But the, 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 my experiences, and, 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 and I, I, it's an opportunity to pay, uh, uh, acknowledge my mother, this is about women, and the, 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 the way that she refused to um, succumb to the pressures to have me adopted, fostered, etc. It wasn't easy, but anyway. So I'm going to now look at, oh, and the area that I'm going to look at is um, screening and counselling for sickle cell. I'm sure most of you are aware that it's an inherited blood disorder, inherited in the same way as cystic fibrosis. In other words, a child that has the condition, as you mentioned, would have inherited it from both the mother and the father. And uh, this is a, a, a publication from the mid-1980s called Sickle Cell Anemia, Who Cares? And it, 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 evolved, it came from a conversation, as things often do, between myself and Usha Prashar, now Baroness Usha Prashar. She was then a director of the Runnymede Trust. And when I was saying that the provisions up and down the country were very ad hoc, she immediately said, right, Running Media is going to uh, fund a research project into it. And it's three women, let's, let's flag up women, it's three women authors here, uh, Usha, myself, and Dr. Misha Brozovic, the then consultant uh, hematologist at, uh, in Brent. So I'm going to now just, as I said, uh, quote from my memoirs uh, to illustrate what the issue was. I talk first of all about a mother that I'd interviewed, who I call Miss J, and she told me that she had been identified as having sickle cell trait during pregnancy. We're talking about this interview was at the late 1970s. Um, but she wasn't informed of this until just before she had her son. Following his birth, she asked two different doctors if her son would get the illness, and each said no, he would be fine. His first admission to hospital at 10 months of age lasted four weeks, and that was when he was diagnosed with sickle cell anemia. This was in London. Miss J talking to me. I don't know whether I was coming or going. I, I thought I would die, actually, because I was walking like I'm not walking at all. I think I was floating, and every time, every day, I go up to see him, he looked like he finished. Coming back to my uh, comment here. So I, I, I was involved in um, doctoral study, and I interviewed 22 parents of children with the condition who'd been followed up in, in uh, Brent from 1962 onwards, but I interviewed primarily the mothers um, in the late 1970s, early 1980s. And my mother very kindly transcribed all the recorded in interviews, for which I was immensely grateful. Many parents spoke about their dreadful experiences, mirroring those of Miss J. Only one woman had ever heard of sickle cell at the time of diagnosis in a child who she and her husband had adopted. All of the mothers had been identified as carriers during pregnancy, but none of them had been informed of their result. They didn't actually know they'd been screened for the illness, and in doing so, they had been identified as healthy carriers of the trait. But there were obviously genetic consequences, which they didn't know anything about. No baby was tested at birth, even though it was possible to do so. The relevant investigation had been developed during the 1950s and was not expensive for blood test. It amazed me that screening and clinical care for sickle cell disease had such a low priority in the NHS, given that it was one of the first conditions to be recognized as a molecular disease. Linus Pauling, the noted American physical chemist and Nobel laureate, had established the molecular basis of sickle cell anemia way back in 1949. In 1982, you'll realize why I talk about 1982 in a minute, Princess Diana and Prince Charles were expecting their first child, Prince William. I thought about the different approach that would have been taken if one or both had been found to be a carrier of an inherited genetic disorder. That's assuming that if they'd found it out earlier, they wouldn't have let them near each other, but you know, hey-ho. Um, <laughs> Every effort would have been made by the health professionals to establish and inform the couple if they were at risk of having an affected child. This is exactly what the parents who I interviewed uh, had wanted. In 1981, I'd been pregnant with my own daughter and my own screening at uh, Queen Charlotte's Hospital, as it happened, had been excellent. The consultant hematologist, Dr. Elizabeth Letsky, was ahead of many of her peers in establishing routine sickle and thalassemia screening and genetic counseling in pregnancy. Because what you may have perhaps picked up is that this was not embedded in the regional clinical genetics units in this country 
as it was for cystic fibrosis. So that's an, an important point. Anyway, um, this would prove to be, my own experience would prove to be important uh, for me. In March 1982, not long after my return uh, to work, I started to offer genetic counseling to pregnant women with sickle cell or other carrier states. Having been so recently pregnant made it easier to empathize with fears of parents to be. Um, then in just conclusion, many of the midwives at the hospital were from Caribbean, Irish, and African origin, and were a great bunch of people to work with. I'm not a qualified midwife, but still, they made me extremely welcome in their world. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, our next contribution is from Laura, who I feel guilty because I haven't read your book. Um, and I hope you'll tell us a bit about uh, Speak Up, which is a campaign guide for rebel girls. I like that. I like that title. Um, she is um, the founder of Stop Taxing Periods, uh, a cause that I think all of this audience will support, uh, to abolish the tampon tax in the UK and to make menstrual products exempt from VAT. About time. Yeah. Laura. Thank you. Thanks for having me, and it's so interesting to hear your stories about campaigning as well. Um, and so my story basically started in 2014, um, and I hadn't ha done any campaigning really before then. I mean, I was a big feminist and loved reading feminist stories online, but I'd never really kind of started anything of my own before. Um, and I was in my student halls and just desperate not to revise when my friend sent me an article. I think it was a BuzzFeed article, and this article said that basically we're taxed for having period products. Um, and I thought that that was maybe something that was justified. Maybe everything else was taxed more. I really didn't know anything about the tax system. Um, until I was so desperate to avoid revision that I decided <laughs> that looking into the tax system would be a fun exercise in comparison. Um, and that's when I became really shocked at what I found in that there are certain items that aren't taxed at all because they are considered to be essential. Um, and those items include maintaining your private helicopters or eating crocodile meat, eating horse meat, um, playing bingo and having alcoholic sugar jellies, which I don't even know is a thing. Um, and so if you are to do all of that, you won't be taxed. But if you're to do all of that on your period, you will be taxed. And it was the fact that this word essential is in HMR law um, and in, on those documents online, but it just made me think, what does that tell society about women and about um, people who menstruate? And is it a luxury for those people to be involved in public life when they're on their period? Like, probably not. Um, but I could just kind of imagine in my mind this room full of probably predominantly men, as Parliament still is, um, thinking to themselves what the average person would be doing and what kind of essential items they will need and probably period products might not have been at the top of that list. Um, but it should be at the top of that list. And the thing that really made me surprised about the tampon tax was that I'd never heard of it before, despite the fact I'd been paying it for a number of years. Um, <coughs> and that was, I think, the think, I think that was the thing that made the campaign so um, kind of successful because we ended up getting 320,000 signatures online um, and we got Obama to talk about it, which was really interesting. And it wasn't really about convincing people that this tax shouldn't exist, it was just about telling people it exists. Um, so that was interesting in that um, lots of people were really supportive of it and I, I never thought I was the first one to, to you know, discover this tax, but I hadn't heard of any campaigns beforehand. Um, until I went home to my, I used, grew up in Devon, so until I went home to Devon, and Paul, one of my best friends, his mum came downstairs um, when I was visiting him, and she said, oh Laura, I really like your campaign, because I used to campaign for this when I was your age. Um, and also, I then met Stella Creasy, MP, who was amazing, and she's really supportive of the campaign, and she said that she used to campaign for it when she was at school, um, and that made me realise that there were so many pockets of people around the country that have been campaigning for this and it's been so easy to silence them in that you can ignore a pocket of people in Devon um, or in sc a school campaigning about this but you can't ignore the 320,000 signatures online 
um, which is also what I think is really exciting, really interesting about online politics and online petitions. Um, but yeah, I think this tampon tax campaign was really interesting because it really reflects the way that we view and value women in that I really think that still we see public life as a masculine sphere mm. and anything that's to do with men is to do with humanity and it's to do with the public realm. But anything to do you know, mainly with women is not really a human's issue, it's a side sidelined issue and it's something that you can talk about not in public. Um, so I think that, yeah, the tampon tax campaign was interesting for me because it brought to light and it brought into the public talking about periods and menstruation and how little we know. Um, there was some research that I recently read that said that although we're all told we have a 28-day cycle, that apparently only applies to 13% of women um, because they weren't consulted when that piece of research came <laughs> out. <laughs> um, so it's just so shocking and... So following that, um, Amica George, who was really, um, she kept emailing me, how can I get involved with the tampon tax campaign? And then this new piece of research came out by um, a charity called Freedom for Girls. It's amazing. And it said that 10% of girls in school in Leeds, they miss school every month because they don't have access to period products. Um, and so she saw that and she started this uh, period poverty campaigning, which has been really interesting because it's just kind of, echoes the same messages as the tampon tax campaign, but to a more extreme extent, um, in that new research has come out to say that almost 50% of girls have missed at least one day of school because they're embarrassed about their periods. And so period poverty has this strange intersection of poverty, um, but also embarrassment and how that kind of impacts women's education and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, thank you for having me. But, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <coughs> Actually, this issue was the first ever stealth tax cut by a chancellor in Britain. When um, some of us persuaded Gordon Brown to reduce the VAT on sanitary products, he did indeed cut the amount of VAT on sanitary products, but he didn't ever announce it in his budget speech. Mm. I wonder why. <laughs> and actually, I think that's one of the reasons that the campaign was so successful, because you actually created an opportunity to talk about menstruation in public. Mm. And I think that has been one of the things that has silenced it, that it's all kind of embarrassing women's bits that we don't want to talk about. And you helped to bring that into the public domain in a way which enabled to, to get justice. Although, I have to say that the way in which the government is spending the money that has come into the centre from their so-called tampon tax fund is, has ignored women's charities almost completely. Wow. And that is an outrage. But anyway, on to our next campaigner. And I actually like, would like to um, admit that I have read the next campaigner's <laughs> book. Um, uh, Gina Martin is the author of Be the Change, which is a rather wonderful account of her campaign against upskirting, how she changed the law, how you could, even if you're really disorganised. And one of the things I loved... <laughs> no, no, she was very honest about her disorganisation. <laughs> Let me introduce you to a woman who has, on average, lost a debit card every six months in the last ten years. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Gina, yes. tell us about campaigning. Your upskirting campaign, how you made a difference, and how we can. Okay, well, thank you for having me. I'm glad you started with that, because it does set the tone for my life. Um, <laughs> that's why I put it in the book. Uh, yes, so in 2017, I, uh, I was working in advertising in an office um, as a creative, coming up with the ideas for adverts. And I'd done that for about three years, and I went to a gig in Hyde Park, British Summertime Festival with my sister and it was a super hot day and a group of guys uh, in the crowd of 60,000 people we were quite deep in the crowd and a group of guys were sort of hitting on me and my sister and I said no I'm fine thanks and then said that another 15 million times um, and started to get a bit annoyed and just said please just leave me alone I really want to have a nice day with my sister I haven't seen her for a year she's my best friend we've paid far too much money to be here and I just want to relax and watch the show we're waiting for the band to come on stage um, and just to like, you know, teach me a lesson, I guess, quote, unquote. 
Uh, they took photos of my skirt, uh, stuck their hands between my legs with their iPhone and took these photos. And I didn't see them do it, but I saw one of the guys on his phone laughing. They were kind of all laughing around me, you know, and you can like feel people are laughing at you. And I saw this photo and I'd had two gins. So I grabbed the phone off him. I was well feeling good, thank you. Uh, always everyone's like, you're so brave. And I was like, I was slightly drunk, but I appreciate that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and grabbed the uh, phone and kind of ran away. We got into a bit of a scuffle and I ran away with the phone and I got the phone and the picture and the guy to the police, which is, let's be honest, what any of these conversations happen, all we do is say to the women what they should have done, right? You could have done more, you could you have done this, et cetera, et cetera, try and fulfill this list of things you need to do if something like this happens to you. And I did all of it. I had everything. I had so many witnesses and the picture and the phone and the guy. And the police just said, there's nothing we can really do. You won't really hear from us. Um, we've had a look at the photo. It shows more than you'd like to show. Um, but because you chose to wear knickers, it's not a graphic image. So we can't prosecute. <laughs> Which is obviously hilarious, because for the past two years, every single comment I've ever got has been to wear trousers so you won't be upskirted. You can't win. So the conversation has to move on from what you're wearing to what the guy did, right? It's absolutely ridiculous that we start that conversation. Um, thanks. So I kind of, I always felt like a five-year-old, and I just kind of went, oh, I guess, and I was crying, and I was really shaken up because we got into a bit of a fight with me and this guy, and he was massive, and I kind of just cried and, and sort of tried to enjoy the rest of the night, uh, missed the whole gig, and then I went home the next day. And I got a call from the police the next day, uh, the most uninterested voice on the other end of the phone, and they said, the, the case has dropped, so you won't be hearing anything else, and they put the phone down. I don't even think they said goodbye. And... Um, I just like was so angry and I'm so glad you pointed on that about the anger in your belly because we use conversations around anger to delegitimize women all the time and being angry is a very normal response to what we're dealing with it's absolutely fine to be angry about stuff and it really annoys me and, uh, and yeah, so then I just was really angry and I thought, okay, well, what would have happened if I was a kid in this situation? What would have happened if I was like seven or eight? Would this be the result? So I, f I went on my phone actually and I found this photo of me and my sister, this selfie we'd taken. The guys had been in the background right before it happened. They just happened to be in the background. So I put that on Facebook. I said, okay, well, the police can't help me. I don't think the law can help me because they said there was nothing they can do, but I hadn't looked into it at that point. I put it on Facebook and I worked in marketing at this point. So I kind of knew how to use social media. It's a science, it's maths. It's not this kind of nebulous thing. And I started to get it out places and it got some traction and some shares. And then Facebook contacted me and said, um, the picture you put up vi violates community guidelines because it's harassment. Because I had alleged that they'd done this thing. So then I got even more angry and punched a wall. <laughs> And then I thought, right, well, I'm really good at social media and I'm really good at digital marketing and I'm just going to start shouting about this. I'm so pissed off about having to brush it off all the time. Sorry for swearing. Um, I'm so bored of it. Like, it wasn't just the upscaling incident. It was everything. You know, it's growing up and being like, oh, I'm not going to take the underpass that protects me from oncoming traffic because the traffic is safer than me going down that tunnel, like, at 16. It's like, you know, your ass being grabbed in clubs. It's everything. You all know what it's like. And I looked into the law and I found out that in England and Wales, upskirting wasn't a sexual offence. It wasn't a specific offence, but in Scotland it had been for 10 years, partly due to kilts. Um, <laughs> it's like a joke campaign, the entire thing. Um, and so, honestly, this is my reaction, like, for six months. Um, and in various other countries around the world, it has been too. And obviously, this was kind of an insidious form of porn. The second most searched for porn is non-consensual porn. I think the first is amateur, so, like, about basically kids. Um, but non-consensual porn is one of the most searched porn types, which is obviously an issue in itself. This had been resigned to that kind of corner of the internet, these pictures that women and girls didn't know were being taken of them. But it had become an everyday form of assault with phones. So I started a petition, started a social media campaign, shouted about it a lot, and then there was an influx of, uh, this was about six months before Me Too had happened. So there was an influx of comments onto my petition site. I was kind of doing media and TV and writing about it because I'd been a freelancer writer for a little bit and I was, you know, God, I must have sent like hundreds of emails asking people to let me write about it and eventually did. And all this influx of comments came to the comment section of the petition from kids and they were like 12, seven and 15 and I realized they're all coming from the same place and I found out they were coming from the school in South London where the male teacher had been up the kids for sort of five years they had that 5,000 photos and the kids couldn't do it they can't even vote right they can't vote they have no democratic voice in any of these conversations they have no kind of resource or access to be able to change these things but I did got a laptop blah 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 started this mad campaign did that all the media went on tv after I found out about the kids because I was like I think we people need to know that this isn't an issue that is happening it doesn't just happen 
like it did to me. This has, is a is a constant problem, and it's in you know schools. It's in um, teachers, female teachers. The young boys were working together to upskill the female teachers. Like it's happening everywhere. So after about six months, or oh, now three months of that media campaign, I realised I was kind of shouting about something, and I was like, someone should do something about this. Like you change things, and then I was like, well. Maybe I'll try and give it a go. Uh, and I'm bored of also giving the job to people to change things who haven't been through it because they're not best placed to understand it. Like, I could have given this to a, a, you know, a, a lawyer or someone, but they haven't been through it. And the people who can change things are the people who actually experienced it because you know the nuances of the situation. You're best placed to do that. So I got a lawyer after a very long time of asking lawyers about stuff. He's called Ryan Whelan, and he was a litigator, and we sat in a room for about three and a half hours, and he's still one of the best guys I've ever met. I actually have his words tattooed on my arm now. Um, He's so wonderful, and he sat together and he said, this is your thing, so I'm not going to take this over. You've done it so well, but I will just amplify your voice and we will write the new legislation. I went up and down the country. We got all the best legal professionals to sign off on the solution we had, which was a very modern progressive law that we'd written, and then we went to Parliament. So all we were saying was, you have to support this piece of paper. We weren't giving them a whole new job to do. We were like, we've done it for you. All the authorities in the country believe in this. Um, and a year of lobbying ensued where we met with hundreds of MPs and got MPs from all sides of the House to agree with this, that it should be, uh, the gap should be closed in the law. It didn't become a Labour issue or a Conservative issue. It became a, it's a human issue. We so often spend time left and right instead of going, looking up and down and going, this is about people. It doesn't have to be a Labour issue or a Conservative issue. This is about people. So we got all these MPs on board and then we tabled a private member's bill. The first one was rejected by a Conservative MP called Christopher Chope, who killed the bill after a year. Boo. Asshole. Um, <laughs> who said he rejected uh, it because it didn't have uh, enough debate, but if he had let it through, it would have gone to committee stage and had debate. Um, when I, s I was in the House for every single part of our bill and f for the campaign, and I asked him why he objected, and he said he hadn't even read it. Um, that's the problem with parliamentary process. Uh, eventually, we got another uh, government bill tabled the next day after Chope objected. It was a huge, new, um, I think it was the UK's most read news story, and the campaign had been in the news a lot. He was um, escorted out of... Parliament with the detail. His office was trashed in Parliament with knickers from his own female colleagues in Parliament. His constituency was covered with knickers. Um, <laughs> he was doorstepped, and then his response was, I don't think people realise how hard this has been for me. <laughs> you literally couldn't write it, hey, all of it. Um, I refused to meet with him. I asked to meet with him and educate him on the law, and then it became apparent he was going to keep objecting. So the next day, I got the I did something like 43 interviews that day and we got the public really angry and I really riled everyone up and said like this is the problem with modern day politics and we went back into the Ministry of Justice the next day and I said they're really angry you know you need to do something and we tabled a government bill and we saw that through for a year and then we changed law in February and which was great And now it means upscaling is a sexual offence, and if it happens in any single scenario, whatever you are wearing, or wherever you are, if someone tries to take photos or video of part of your body that you've chosen to cover by clothes, and that's the language, the language is very modern in this law, and very accessible, it means that you can prosecute, and it's Sexual Offences Act, and all the punishments go from um, fines um, to... You're on the sexual offenders register if you do it, all the way to two years in prison. So if we went back to this male teacher who'd done this to kids, he would now be in prison for two years. And that's kind of where we went with that. But critically, you've seen these amazing women speak tonight about what they've done. Like, there is no reason that no one else can do these things. Like, the difference is just making a decision and working really hard. Like, I'm not an academic person. I'm scraped by in school. And as you've heard, I'm not, a, not an organised person either. But it doesn't matter because you guys know what it's like. You're the people who can change it because you understand it the most. So, yes, thank you for having me, and happy to be here. <laughs> right, I want to pick up on that issue which you both uh, talked about, about <laughs> anger. To all of you, how important is anger, outrage, in generating uh, a campaign? Um, well, I think... As we probably all know, but like anger, I've, I mean, I've dealt a lot with anger in like my past and like I've, I think activism, I, it's not like it helped me deal with my anger, but um, when it's, it's an energy. So once you have an energy, like if you just get depressed about things, like not being as they should be, if you actually get angry, then you have an energy that helps you get things moving, in my opinion. Uh, and that can actually turn into passion that uh, motivates you to 
get like the, basically the change moving. And uh, so I've had like few bad personal experiences that actually made me very angry about certain things. So yeah, I'm very committed to women's <laughs> rights. <laughs> yeah, Elizabeth. Um, where I really, as I said, when I was doing my memoirs, I was um, thinking of some of the books that uh, have influenced me. And one of them is um, President Obama's um, Dreams from My Father. And there is a section in it where he's, is before he becomes president, or, and he's, I think he's completed his law degree, I, don't, I can't remember. He goes to Chicago, he wants to be a community organizer. He gets interviewed by Mr. Kaufman, and they have coffee, he gets the job. But Kaufman says to him, hold on, what's a middle class guy like you coming to apply for a job like this? You must be very angry about something. And you, the words sort of leapt from the page as I was reading it. It was like the, the sort of suave, intellectual, laid back, cool, Obama, me, angry, me. And then he starts to reflect on his own life and realized that actually there were layers of anger and that he, yeah, he hadn't realized it. And, and in a way, that woke me up. And that's why I say sometimes my, my, my book is Think Philomena. You know Philomena, don't you? Yeah. Think Philomena meets Barack Obama's dreams from my father. Anger is so important. In Philomena's case, the anger was vented on her by the Catholic Church and et cetera, et cetera. Obama didn't realize, but he was starting to use his anger in a more productive way. And I go around the country now giving talks, pr pr primarily to NHS staff, predominantly women, predominantly nurses and midwives. And when I mention this point about anger, th the resonance, I mean, the nodding that goes on. People, and it's like some people, well, a lot of people have said it's helped them to think that it's not a negative thing to be anger. It's not something wrong with us. It's, a, it's not a weakness about us. But how do we use that anger? Because, you know, how how much has that anger affected all of us with high blood pressure, um, emotional distress, et cetera, et cetera. Um, let, let's, let's make use of that anger. And I love it as well. Same. I think anger Same. is Same. really good. Exactly, I'm, although it's really interesting to think about how genderedly anger mm. is portrayed. A yes. male can have rage, yes. and that's quite a positive thing. That means he's gonna win it's something. True. Whereas women's anger is pettish, is mm you know, That's she's true. a bitch, she's all that thing. I mm. think, mm. you know, we yeah. need to reclaim yeah. our anger. <laughs> Laura. Yeah. yeah, I definitely agree. And I think that, oh, sorry, thanks. Um, yeah, I definitely agree. And I think that for women, you're emotional or, you know, you're sporadic or somehow it, me it means that you shouldn't be powerful because you have this weird, uncontrollable thing inside of you that makes you emotional. Um, no matter how old you are or who you are, um, if you're a woman, it's going to be bad. So I think definitely anger is something to just be good in motivating you and telling your story. And you shouldn't be afraid of your emotion that you have into your... Um, folded into your activism because everybody has that and I think that as you were saying mm -hmm. it makes you in a really unique position to make changes because you have experienced this thing that's making you angry that's making you want to make the change in the first place so mm -hmm. it's yeah it goes hand in hand with activism definitely yeah can I just add to yeah. that um, as you said like it's very gendered I think in the way it's perceived but I also think it's it society sees sees it look different on different people so I've experienced with me in the media doing the campaign Yes, I got a lot of stuff about being an angry feminist, and that's so annoying because I had a point and I was right about that. Um, but also, there was more, I was a more palatable person to be angry in the media compared to my black female friends who are campaigning because they're just ang angry black women who don't have a point mm -hmm. in the media's eyes. So we have to see how we also check anger on other women that don't look and sound like us in the same way that we expect men to check it when they look at us and think about our anger too. But I just want to add that point in there. women have had the power to change something not necessarily completely not necessarily in the to the degree that their ambition has been but actually tell me about how you got that power and what added to your individual power uh, the power to campaign yeah but yeah <laughs> well the my personal story is that uh, actually, I, I was very living like very carefree, and then like I was in China once on the tube, and like I was quite like like molested like quite intensely, 
by, by a man and like I was very angry, like very, very angry. And like at some point, like my, my head just like went somewhere else, like completely disconnected. And, like it was the first time that actually like I, f I found out that like anger like doesn't have to be like an energy that like is super toxic like inside of you and like what like the mind can actually control like anger uh it was a weird thing but basically after that like i got a bit into like uh you know like meditation and all of this and i learned how to control my anger and like turn into something more positive and like not toxic for me uh and uh actually the how i got passionate about like my power as a woman and women's rights is when I was living in India for about like a year and I was living in a border, like in a bordering town with Pakistan. And like, of course, like the, the I saw like it's, it's very deep injustices like and like gender oppression like, <coughs> like I had never experienced because I was living in the US at the moment. And like, so, well, before that. And like, so that just motivated me to like understand how privileged actually I was as a woman, like within, like in the world, I guess. And uh, that gave me the power to be like positive, like and proactive about change. And like, so, and know that like, I do have power because like there's a lot of people that actually have a lot less power than you have. And so, yeah, that motivated me to be like conscious and like about my energies and like how to like unleash sort of the potential with like <laughs> for a positive thing, yeah. <laughs> Elizabeth, tell me about the power that, I mean, the, I remember talking to Clive about the statue campaign at the beginning when he really thought it wasn't going to work. How did you get the power to create an alliance which funded that yeah. brilliant <coughs> statue? It, 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 <laughs> there was this small and really small group of people, there was probably up, maybe up to a dozen at the most, eight to a dozen individuals, um, mainly in this country, but it was led by somebody abroad, who seemed to be incandescent with, a woman, incandescent with rage, that anybody would dare to be promoting a campaign, to have this Mary Seacole, who wasn't even a nurse, wasn't even, and you know, you had to point out, it's that this, this year is the 100th anniversary of the registration of nursing, excuse me, so we go back 100 years, so we get to what, come on, help me out, 1919, yeah. Mary Seacole died in 1881, excuse me, no. how the hell could anybody be a registered nurse then, but yeah. let's, let's leave, yeah. can you see the anger coming, can you see the anger coming? And there was, an, there was an arrogance to the, I felt, I saw, I read, I saw, there was, there was arrogance and superior, a sense of superiority in this group of people who thought they were better than us. How dare this statue be cited in this hallowed ground of St. Thomas's Hospital, which of course, understandably, is linked with Florence Nightingale. Now, you know, what was interesting from a woman's point of view was, a woman was leading this small campaign to pitch one Victorian woman against another Victorian woman. Hey, ho! You know, you couldn't invent it, could you? Yeah. You could not invent it. And do you think we've got enough women's statues? Why are we arguing about having another one? You know? Yeah. And yeah. all of this, and of course the race element, I mean, now we're into intersectionality. I mean, I, I, when I looked into what intersectionality was, I thought, we, we all, I've lived through intersectionality. And the anger, was just well it wasn't it wasn't sitting there it was just, it was like a volcano came from physical abuse from my stepfather from being threatened with failure as a health visitor uh, in the 70s because i dared to question the illogical use of some questions that uh, data on on anyway it was just ridiculous so i'm a, the questioning nature of us all can get us into an awful lot of trouble and particularly as you know What's this black woman, mixed race woman doing, daring to challenge us around our policies and our strategies? And of course, alongside anger, of course, is our intellect and our ability to get the facts and to, to gradually learn from others. You know, I've observed how you operated. Don't, you didn't know that, but I did. <laughs> and, and, and what was it I liked about these powerful women and a few men um, that got them to achieve something? 
and what were the mistakes that I had been making that had sort of set me back. And what it was was inner confidence. I lacked inner confidence because as a child I'd been challenged um, with, you know, we all ask, where, do you, where are you from? There's nothing wrong with the question, where are you from? But as a small child, and it was a woman, she, she looked really ancient to me, she was probably about 30, but she, <laughs> she, she, she bent over to me. I was born and brought up in the Midlands, and um, she said, where are you from, my dear? I said, Birmingham? No, 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 and I remember this finger wagging, no, 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 where are you really from, Birmingham? Because I didn't know, I, I had my mother's maiden name, which was an Irish surname. I didn't meet my father until I was, find my father until I was 25. All these factors did help my inner confidence. And it's beautiful when you reach a point when you know that you've got the facts. You've also got the network. So when you're so depressed with being rejected and talked down to, you can pick up a phone or talk to a friend, whatever. Uh, and then you have this, you, you sort of start to learn tricks of the trading campaign, don't you? It's great fun. Uh, and I think we shouldn't sort of forget that because that's what keeps us going when we get some horrible experiences, such as to finish off in the statue campaign, where those, that small group thought that they had their foot into the establishment, which in a sense they, you know, but they were out of date. I mean, you should, I'd love to have known you then because I like Twitter and, <laughs> and I, oh, social media. But it was the arrogance that they thought writing a letter to the Times Right. Sorry, I'm, I'm showing my prejudices now. But, you know, <laughs> as though that was good. And we, we, we were reaching many more people through social media, through going up and down the country talking. You know, and I'm thinking, and I was determined that I was going to beat this group. That, because it was, I was vice chair of the, of the appeal. So it was, it was a group effort. But I was retired and I had the energy. And I was determined that my granddaughter was not going to have the same experiences as I had, that she saw no role models like herself. She saw no monuments that it sort of looked like her. That was what kept me going. Actually, just to follow on on the statue uh, situation, it's just down the road near uh, Westminster, just past New Scotland Yard. Um, there's a little park there, and there's six statues, and five of them are men, and one of them is of a dog. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> About people who were heroes in the World War. So, Amazing. Yeah. Um, anyway, I thought that was interesting. But um, yeah, so for me, I think the internet was a huge part of um, getting kind of power to change things. And there's some interesting statistics by Change.org, and um, they say that the majority of their campaigns are started by men, but the majority of their successful campaigns, so the ones that reach their goal, are started by women. Um, the majority of their signers are women, the majority of their sharers online are women. So I think that's really exciting, really interesting, because it's this new political sphere that women can totally take a hold of and can make changes through and be listened to in a way that they never have before in traditional politics and in parliament. So I think for me, campaigning through the internet has been really interesting. Um, and then speaking up about things online has been really interesting, um, whether it be about periods or anything else. And the more I talk about periods, the more I realize people don't talk about them, people don't know anything about them. And I remember when, uh, in my previous job, um, my friend went to the bathroom, and when she was going to the bathroom, she stuffed a, a tampon up her sleeve, which I think quite a lot of people do. Um, and when she was going there, she, the, this tampon fell out of her sleeve and it went onto the floor. And my colleague, who was about 35, with children, so I probably should have known better, he pointed at the tampon and he said, oh, she dropped a sweet. Because he didn't know what a tampon looked like. Wow. Yeah, it was quite shocking. Um, well, so don't hide it in your sleeve yeah, really anymore. Yeah, period proud, period yeah. proud, yeah. Um, but, so yeah, I just think... The internet is allowing us to kind of <laughs> redefine these kind of conversations and yeah, make political changes that we haven't been before. So. Mm. I totally yeah. agree. Gina. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I sort of want to just sit here and... I'm just, the panels are so hard because I'm like, I want to be like, so tell me more about that, but I can't. <laughs> um, uh, where did you get the power from? Was that the question? Yes. Uh, two things, I think. I think online, I think I had felt like I was frustrated about things on my own for a long time. I knew that people felt the same. I knew that the conversations were out there, but I didn't have... 
I do now have the support system because I've been working in this space for two years. Like I have friends and people around me who really get it. And my parents are incredibly progressive. Like my dad took me out to buy my first all my tampons and they threw me a period party when I came up a period of 16. <laughs> so like they've always been amazing. But I didn't have this group of people who like would buoy me up in real life. And I found that online during the campaign. And the communities that you can be part of online are just incredible. So that was kind of where I found the power when it got really hard. It was so much bigger than me. And being able to go into these spaces and, and have conversations and feel like these people carrying me a bit was amazing. There's also another thing, but I always feel like I don't know how to articulate it because I think it's going to sound disrespectful and I don't want it to sound that way, but there are brilliant and bright people in traditional establishments. There are brilliant and bright people in Parliament. There are brilliant and bright people in ev everywhere. But I also like have seen so many average men who are very confident <laughs> making massive, massive, massive strides. And I've seen so many brilliant women who are too shameful and too embarrassed to make those strides. And I think we so often like metabolize like confidence as competence in our head. And it's not. Mm -hmm. So like, and one of the questions I always get is like, so do you have imposter syndrome really bad like, when you were doing this? And I'm like, yeah, but your assumption is that I do because I'm a woman. Like I couldn't have gone in there confident, right? Like your assumption is, it's like when, you know, oh, it's kind of like amazing that you're that confident with this because it must've been really hard and it was really hard. But also I was right about this. You don't have to be an academic to know that something's wrong. And I just, I felt power for bit, having seen so many men that weren't very good at what they're doing, didn't really know what they were talking about. And having seen so many brilliant women who did, but were too sh scared to do anything about it. So I don't feel like anymore like, I'm like, why can't we do this? Because there's so many incompetent men who are so confident who are doing such a shit job. Like, <laughs> I'm so sorry, but there is. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you're lovely cameraman. You're, lovely, you're not incompetent, or none of you are here. <laughs> Right, this is the Fawcett Society, we say it like it is. I'm sorry. Um, I, I'm just going to sort of name some of the things I've heard, and then I'm going to give you the chance to ask questions. I've heard, and this is advice for us all, I think. Be confident. Be angry and own your anger. I think one of the things about anger, if you don't do anything about it, then it's horrible. Mm. But if you use it to drive your issue forward, actually, it's empowering. Um, I think the point is it, it's fun. Yeah. Actually, changing the world is a fun thing to do. It is a joy. If you succeed, you feel bloody good about yep. yourself. And <laughs> you also live in a world which is better than it used to be. Um, have energy and ambition. Use social media as your ally. I think that's a worthwhile one because we meet talking earlier about some of the scary things in social media, but I think that we should be able to use it as an, our ally. And actually, don't be scared. One of the problems that we as a sex class suffer from is that we spend more of our lives scared than men do. And I think we yes. just shouldn't be scared. Yes. Um, <laughs> Over to you. Who's got a question for the panel? Yeah, over there. I'm just going to say that so that everyone can hear. The question was that there's a sense in which men joining into a campaign legitimises the campaign, and it doesn't work the other way around. I think it depends what sphere it's in. I definitely noticed that with the campaign I was in, because I feel so bad I can't look at you. Um, I noticed that with the campaign with, in Parliament, because I had Ryan, who was this massive male lawyer behind me, and they didn't listen to me until I had that. Um, I think it depends what sphere you're operating in, but it's also about, I think, realising that we are still operating in spheres that are completely in, unequal and will still subjugate us and won't listen to us because that's the culture we're in. And the dream is that we can go out there and, and be listened to without that. But I think you can in certain spheres. Like, I think online, 
and like I know brilliant women who are heading up campaigns all the time who don't need you know Amica George all these wonderful people who are doing great stuff who don't need guys behind them but I think in certain spheres sadly it helps but it's also about vocalizing that in those spaces and making it obvious in those spaces that that shouldn't be the case instead of just going through it with the guy behind you I made that very very clear in parliament that they shouldn't just listen to me because Ryan was there and I used to turn up to things on my own when they thought he was coming and then do it myself um, so it's about vocalizing that but also realising that is still part of the issue, but not letting that hold you back, because it shouldn't be. Elizabeth. Men. So, yeah, men. So, um, <laughs> what, I, what I found in the sickle campaign, because there were so many different issues that so many people did campaign on, but, but from my own personal experience, I, looking back and thinking about this issue, I've realised it's to um, women MPs that I have actually worked with. Um, Diane Abbott is an example. Um, and I don't know whether it's because, well, obviously I felt, well, I just felt they could, they got it, they yeah, understood, so. and um, they gave me a lot of advice. A lot of it was behind the scenes, so I think I, I maybe uh, can see where sometimes it would appear that men were fronting some of this up, or took, 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 took the accolades. And um, I don't, I, I have to listen to music on the radio because I find the talk, I can't deal with it. Um, and so people alert me when they hear things that they know will send my blood pressure up. Great. Um, <laughs> about people claiming that they were in the front line. Um, some occasion it's women, actually. But a lot of it has, has been male-centered. And I think because I've been so comfortable dealing with women and that I've had strong women in terms of you know, what my mother put up with in her life in order for me to do something. And in, just in my own personal life, it struck me there's my mother, um, she never got, well, she did get married, but she wasn't married when she had me. And um, my poor grandmother, uh, uh, and I've got, I owe a lot to my late grandmother because she rescued me uh, and my grandfather when my stepfather was physically abusing me. So uh, she was so scared of um, me following in my mother's footsteps in terms of having a baby outside of marriage. It was a Roman Catholic Irish heritage, just throw that in. And um, when I look back, my mother, yeah, I was single when she had me. I'm single. My daughter is single. So I think, you know, my poor grandmother, she, <laughs> she, she, she wouldn't have liked it probably. But um, I'm saying all this because women feature so strongly, women and, and yeah, a young woman, in terms of my grandmother, they feature so much in my close family network that we're constantly talking about women's issues. It's coming from a woman's perspective. So that's my natural without ever having analyzed it, I've gradually realized that's what's been very, very influential. And when I think of some of the really negative experiences I've had that have really knocked me back, it's, it's been men. And occasionally, some, you know, the odd person that I thought was being supportive. But when the lime, the, what's the limelight? I'm getting a bit tired, was on me, this particular ma male did not like it. And, and I really did suffer. Fortunately, there were others that I was able to seek support from, because that was one night I, I cried, you know, at night, I couldn't get to sleep, because I was so shocked, and, and the rev, rev, revelation of why this individual was acting like this was actually exactly what, you're, what, you're, what you've um, highlighted, yeah. Wow, interesting. Other questions? Yes, here. And it, it's been a bit weird, actually. Like, a couple of days ago, my friend said it to me, the Tories, they put on their Instagram, which I wasn't following, but they put on their <laughs> Instagram that 10 interesting things in their manifesto. Number one was abolishing tampon tax. Um, so, I mean, it's been interesting in that different political figures have got involved in the campaign that's been quite 
I didn't expect them to. So the first one was actually Nigel Farage, as if he cares oh, about yes. women. Can I just no. explain why <laughs> Boris and Nigel yes. will abolish the tampon yes. tax? It's because the reason why there is still 8% VAT on tampons yes. is because it isn't defined as an essential project product. It has to be at the minimum level of VAT in the European Union. So leaving means that they can abolish it. But actually, they could redefine it. Yeah, but, yes. and then but the annoying thing is they already have. So it's, it's annoying that it was involved in Brexit and a lot of people said, this is why we need to leave the EU. But then we changed European law. So basically... Stella Creasy was amazing, she's a great MP, but she was concerned that we wouldn't win because we need to change European laws, and European law has never, ever ended a single tax on a specific item before. Mm -hmm. So we went to the European Union and we asked them to do that, and every <coughs> single country unanimously said, yes, they will do it. So they have changed the law in the EU now, so it's not even a European issue. No, <laughs> it's it's thing. because it looks good for them. Like, you know, <coughs> all these all like Nigel Farage will support this, like many other politicians support the upskirting campaign, but Nigel Farage can't change the law, but he'll support it because it makes him look good to say it. That's what they do. That's what they do. But, yeah. It's men only Holden, women's campaigns. Fair enough. <laughs> you wanted to. Just on anger um, and women and anger, it's very interesting that I was reading this morning that women and anger, they are often told that they are throwing their toys out of the mm -hmm. So that even the metaphor becomes gender. Yeah. I think, I think women are always facing belittling metaphors. Mm. You know, um, that we whine, we, we, you know, uh, we bitch, we gossip, uh, we're hysterical. These are all words that are never used about men. Mm. And actually, our language is where I think your dictionary campaign has uh, some real you know, uh, importance. Our language is gendered in a way which diminishes women. And we need to be aware of that and to actually stand up to it. Mm. You know, to say the word hysterical is a very sexist word. It, it derives from the Latin for your womb, mm -hmm. and actually, it's, it's never applied to men, and it's yeah. inappropriate, yeah. Mm -hmm. and we should call it out every time it's used. Yes. Uh, more questions? Can I just ask? Yeah, over there <laughs> with the beige jumper. Please stand up. <laughs> Money. Yeah. Mine was almost entirely, I didn't fund it because it was all through social media, so like all of it was free, but then the money, I created a social, the social media campaign in my own time, because there's money or time, right? That is funding it. So like, if you have the money, you can spend the money, but if you don't, you can spend the time, and now we have this free tool that we can use. But uh, with, with my lawyer, that was pro bono, because I'd done a free campaign that had got so much uh, pre press, that then I sold it into law firms, and I said, it's in your interest to want to support this for free. Um, you can't be pay you can't be asking a, a victim of sexual harassment to pay to do the right thing. That's not the right thing. So do this for free, and they did. Um, but this is a very good point because I also think if you choose, a lot of people will choose to do activism. I get asked all the time at book events, like young girls go, "How can I do activism as a job?" And I'm like, "It's not a job. You don't make any money from it. You lose money from it." Um, and I'm in a privileged position where I had a full-time job, so I could do it around <coughs> my job. Um, but really, it was, it was my time was the cost, it wasn't the money. Um, but social media gives us such a tool to be able to get change process. You can get things for free that you wouldn't be able to get before because you have a social media campaign that's working really well, and that is a free tool. But activism and um, creating campaigns can cost a lot of money. How have you experienced that? Yeah. Or money? Yeah, I agree. Well, I started it when I was a student, obviously. So that like makes you a lot more free in terms of gives you more time to do stuff whenever you want to. Um, but then when I had to go into the working world, it was a lot more difficult. Um, so yeah, I've got nine to five now, and you just kind of have to do it outside of working hours, which is hard to c like continuously be motivated to do it after you finish your working day. Um, and to also find an employer that is okay with that. So I found that really hard in that... <laughs> Um, I used to work for a political party and they just hated me doing anything because you have to be political to get into politics. But once you're in politics, they hate you being political. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, if anything, it does cost you um, to be a campaigner a lot of the time, which is really sad, but it's definitely something we should be talking about. Mm. Um, and just like this few F, F you pay me campaign group that we're in, and it's like... 
a lot of people are asked to do a lot of stuff for free as well, which is, um, you know, kind of interesting to how we kind of view women and women's labour too. Um, so, yeah, it is hard, but it is fun and it's enjoyable and you do get a lot from it. So. Mm. Elizabeth, you actually had to raise a lot of money to get the statue built. We certainly did, three quarters of a million pounds. And um, it took 12 and a half years. So have time on your side. But um, I think but we have to remember that it started in 2003 before many of us were involved, you know, with the social media really hadn't reared its head. And certainly we saw the impact, the positive impact of social media towards the end of it. But one, one campaign, the funding is quite interesting. Become retired. Well, I was going to say become retired, but of course, once you all retire, it'll be tough. So when I retired, um, sorry, <laughs> um, I, I, well, I was in a position to not have to worry so much about child care, well, child care costs, etc. I mean, going, looking back into the campaigning era in the sickle era, uh, um, in, the, uh, in the 80s, you know, the small child, single parent, etc. It was relying on friends and, and, and colleagues. But there was one lovely campaign. It was short, sharp. Oh, I did enjoy this one. It, this was um, when Michael Gove, go on, you can hiss, um, <laughs> wanted to get Mary Seacole and other, w particularly women, um, historical icons out of the curriculum. Do you remember that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And it it happened over it, it happened over the Christmas period. I think it, I can't remember when it was. I think it was about 2013, if I remember rightly. And and that played into our hands in a way because a lot of the influential figures who were behind who wouldn't have bothered about this were skiing or you know they just weren't around. But a few of us were around, and we, we, we read about this. And we thought, oh no, this isn't going to happen, you know. And we linked up with um, uh, a few groups, uh, OBV, uh, Operation Black Boat, was one. Uh, there, were, there, there were others. And this is where the fun comes in. So we had a small meeting in North London somewhere. We were all sitting in a room, we said, what, what are we going to do about this? Yeah, how very dare he, you know, this is outrageous. So we said, you know, there's this online um, petitions, this, this had just started. I said, why don't we do an online petition? Does anybody know how you do it? So the OBV people knew how to do it. And I, they also contacted Runnymede, I think, for some advice. And that was delightful. In, 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 in about four weeks, we got oh, 36,000 signatures. Again, bear in mind, it was over this quiet, quiet period. But what the person, I don't know whether this happens anymore, but what the person who advised us about this online campaigning, which of course was free, was that they set it up in those days that every person that signed, there, there, there would be an email notification to Michael Gove's office. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Does that still happen? Yes. Best. Yeah. Anyway, she got back into the curriculum. <laughs> so. so good. Yeah. If I can just. How about money and your campaign? Yeah. I just wanted to add a point about language. Uh, I think like language actually actively is actively oppressing us. Like whether like the mental voices that we hear about like imposter syndrome that Gina talked about, etc. It's always coming from something we've heard since when we were little or like when we were growing up. So I think like language is actually very, very important. Like all of these campaigns are actually like in the media now about like how we, how journalists write about like victims, like people that, women that have been murdered by men. Mm -hmm. They're actually, you know, like shaming victims all the times mm -hmm. and like we have to actually stand up. Like, and it's, it's actually nice that like we're talking about it a lot, yeah. but yeah, anyway. Um, so on the point of money, I, we actually haven't really spent any money on this campaign. Um, I, I think the most important thing also when it comes to marketing is to find out who your stakeholders are, are and like make sure you, you have like a, a good pitch uh, sent to the right people. And like if you 
they can actually help amplify your voice and um, build a network. Like, so for example, like we have a campaign team that like, of course, like the more people you are, like the less work you have to put into a campaign and like the more support you have. And uh, so yeah, we haven't spent any money at all. And of course, I think, I mean, I love activism, so it's, it just makes me happy. So it's not really a job for me. And I have, I have a full-time job, clients of my own, like I have actually a lot to do, but I think everyone can do it. Like as long as you do something that you're passionate about, you, you just find the time to do it because it's fun. Yeah, we have like brunch meetings on Sundays. Like, <laughs> yeah, so, so. We're bumping up against the time and this is going to be the last question. Yes, the red arm at the back. family not being particularly supportive uh, come on team I always like infiltrate my presence so for example my dad is obsessed with books so I also get always get him feminist books um, that he probably wouldn't have bought himself otherwise <laughs> um, so that's one way of getting over it but I also just like to slip in little um, like experiences that have happened to me over the year uh, say for example I, I really want to tell the story to my parents this year of um, my, so my boyfriend recently moved to countries and he's met a lot of new people. Um, and when anybody, like he tells anyone that he has a girlfriend, they always say to him, oh, what does she look like? Give me a picture. And I've recently moved to a new job. And whenever they ask me, uh, whenever I tell them about I have a boyfriend, they always say, oh, what does he do? He do yeah. 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 Um, so those kind of like little experiences that have happened in the year, um, I kind of just drip feed them to my family over Christmas. <laughs> That's my plan anyway. <laughs> Oh God, it's so hard. Um, it's such a hard one. Like it's so frustrating. Uh, I kind of I try and make people realise it's not just me that's feeling like this. So like I will send articles by like the media um, platforms that someone likes. So like to my friend, my male friend who like was really into like I don't know the Guardian. I'll send him like a Guardian piece, or I'll send him like small things from social or videos. You know, Buzzfeed and like all these amazing websites do videos that feel very not. I don't know what an angry feminist is, but they just are interesting editorials, but they have a message to them. And they're kind of, whether that's an interview or whatever with a star or Emma Watson talking about something or whatever, I'll send things to people so they realize it's not only me talking about this, everyone else is talking about this, you're just not engaging with it. Um, but also I would say like, I know we, as women, we want to educate everyone that we love and we want to shake them all the time to be like, why don't you care about this, this like this much? Why don't you want to talk about this? But also, you have to realise that like, you deserve to just like, enjoy your Christmas and not have to educate someone all the fucking time. You know? Like, you, it's not on you. It's not on you all the time to educate everyone in your life. And I know you feel like you want to, but also, like, if you have other people around you that you can have those conversations with, have a Christmas dinner with your friends who really get feminism, so you feel like you've emulated that experience, but you've really got stuff out. And then go to your dinner and, and just get a bit drunk and be like, mm-hmm. Like, you don't, I just don't want us to always feel like you can't also enjoy things. Like, create a space where you feel like you can get all that out and you can have that conversation. And you feel you've got your hard facts, you've got your information. Slip a couple of them into the conversation. Facts are always great to go. Lead with facts, not emotion, because no one responds to emotion because they're all dead inside. Um, but ha have a couple of facts out on the table. Tell people when things happen, but also just enjoy your Christmas. You know, like, you, you deserve to enjoy that. You fight the patriarchy all year round. Like, you know. <laughs> So, the last quote from the book. <gasps> yes. The person I spend Christmas with, obviously with my daughter and my granddaughter, um, I say here, there's no doubt that working and lobbying for sickle cell consumed a lot of my time. As Nina, a friend and former colleague said, what I admire about you most is how focused you are, though I have at times said under my breath, enough about sickle. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and we're spending Christmas together, so. <laughs> Beatrice. Uh, well, my family luckily is super supportive and there, there's no sexist people in the family, so I, I think we can like safely speak about these issues without it being a fight. 
so I don't know. Oh, well, Sorry. Well, that's woman. nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think uh, I think ending this on a note about Christmas is uh, positive. I have to say, one of the things I found, my father was a very right-wing conservative, and I became a Labour MP. But we managed to have conversations in which we disagreed most of the time without anyone ending up feeling that they were upset. I mean, I do recall one time when I was about 19 that I emptied a bowl of sugar on him in a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, uh, we, if you love them, you can kind of forgive them being wrong and they can forgive you being wrong. <laughs> And that's kind of how it goes. Anyway, but you're right. I am <laughs> going exactly. You are right. I hope everyone. I hope everyone in this hall feels a bit more confident and a bit more inspired about going out there and changing the world for the better. Am I right? <laughs> Great. And now we are going to offer you some. Positive refreshment. Um, it's actually sponsored by Ketch, uh, Sketch uh, Restaurant, Ooh. which was apparently the first place that Millicent Fawcett ever made a speech. It's mm -hmm. a frightfully grand restaurant now, but that's pretty impressive. And Chapel Down are providing the alcohol. So thanks to them both Aww. as our sponsors. And I also want to say, anyone who's involved with the Fawcett Local Group, you're invited to uh, attend a meet-up in the drama room from quarter past five. And that's at the end of that corridor there. You have to go through a number of uh, doors. Anyway, thank you all for making this a lovely conference. Go outside, have a drink, and have a gossip with other people here.